Hey guys, Gaia Gaius here. Well, we're back after a long hiatus with something new. Happy holidays, by the way. You guys read the title of this video, and today is the day we finally get to talk about this. For those who are unfamiliar, Gundam Sentinel was a story written by Masaya Takahashi, one that was featured in Japan's Model Graphics magazine from 1987 to the summer of 1988. To this day, the story is widely regarded as one of the most popular Universal Century side stories within the greater timeline. However, due to a myriad of complex legal reasons, the story has never been officially animated or given proper treatment by Sunrise. To this day, though, Sentinel is regarded by many as one of the greats, despite its unique nature as an entry. This story is also marked as a pivotal one within the Gundam franchise, as it marks the official first debut of the legendary Hajime Katoki, one of the most influential and iconic artists within the Gundam pantheon. Pretty much all of Sentinel's original mobile suit designs were designed and influenced by Mr. Katoki, and these machines are seen by many as some of his best work. Many suits like the Nero, Zeku Ainz, Zeta Plus, Gunner Mark V, and the titular S Gundam are all fan-favorite mobile suits to this day. Yet to this day, and due to the nature behind Sentinel's precarious existence within the franchise, many people and casual fans don't even know what the deal is with the story. The characters have made cameos and other entries in games, but have never been on the big screen. Some people may recognize the excess and some of the other mobile suits, but don't really know the actual tale that surrounds them. Some will know of the existence of Alice and the new decides, but many won't know the reasons behind their existence. Thus, with this video, I aim to tell this story to you, not in an animated format, or as a deep line-by-line -line retelling of the story, as I have done in the past with Gaia Gear, but for this particular story, we're going to be going with a simple rundown of the plot of the novel, covering the basic rundown of the book chapter by chapter, with brief notes on things I myself had made when I noticed stuff while reading it. Keep in mind that this is actually my first time fully reading this book to completion, and with this video, I do want to do this story justice, while also being as informative as possible. This novel, unlike Gaia Gear's radio drama, does not read itself out like a Gundam show. Rather, the story plays itself out much more with the aesthetic of its mobile suit designs, a deep, dialogue-driven military and political drama, something that the original Gundam went along with, but for the case of this tale, Sentinel leans very heavily towards the hardened battlefield drama that encompasses the idea of mobile suit warfare. I understand if you may be a little upset by the fact that the series will be shorter than my previous work, but Sentinel as a story is actually pretty short in and of itself. It's only a single book, and it's actually a very light read. Now that that little intro is out of the way, let's begin our story. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. Firstly, the prologue. In it, we are introduced to each one of our cast members one by one throughout a series of independent scenes. From the way each scene is written, you get the sense that these moments are actually occurring simultaneously to one another. Each of these characters are all about to meet each other for the very first time, each of them being from all different walks of life, yet each of them have all been chosen or have been assigned in some way to be a part of the Federation's Mobile Suit Instructor Corps, all of them not knowing that this place will be a destined encounter for all of them. For those who don't know, Mobile Suit Instructor Corps are exactly what they sound like. They are a group or a unit that is comprised of elite and skilled Mobile Suit pilots, and their job is to train and mentor other Mobile Suit pilots for the Federation, as well as to test out any experimental and state-of-the-art technology that the Federation develops. This particular group we're about to see here are all going to be a part of the same group for the time being. The year is Universal Century 0085, two years following the events of Operation Stardust and two years before the events of Zeta Gundam. At this time, the Titans are near the height of their power, yet have shown their true colors with their massacre at Colony 30. In our first scene, we're introduced to two very important characters, Tosh Cray and Stoll Mannings. Both of these men are veterans of the One Year War, and will somewhat act as the representative second commands of both our heroes and villains. They both pilot GMs, and the scene goes on to tell us what kind of relationship these two have. You see, Stoll is an amputee. He lost his leg during the One Year War, and the loss of it was the result of saving Tosh's life in battle. We are told by their interaction that the two are very good friends. However, Tosh has bigger goals. 
and is looking forward to his next assignment. He's been reassigned to be a part of the new Federation Instructor Corps, with Stoll himself sadly having to stay behind, as he has a suspicion that his condition is seen by his superiors as a hindrance. Regardless, Taj is grateful to him and even offers to vouch for him if he ever chooses to come over and join him. The two give each other a brotherly pat on the back, part ways, not knowing that the next time they meet, it sadly won't be as allies. Our second scene within the prologue is actually dedicated to the introduction of our protagonist, a young cocky mobile suit pilot by the name of Ryu Roots. His introduction shows us that despite his high level of skill with being a pilot, he has a severe tendency to disregard the authority of his Earthnoid superiors. Ryu, at least at this moment, is the type of person who doesn't exactly get along with others, and is quite reckless in combat. Despite this, he has been chosen to be a part of the new core, the superior giving him the envelope with his transfer orders and being happy to just finally find a way to kick him out of his office. All the while questioning why on earth someone would choose someone as difficult to rein in as Ryu Roots. Our third scene introduces us to a young man named Josh Offshore. Josh comes from an incredibly wealthy and powerful family within the Federation government. His family has been grooming him on the path of the highest level of success within the Federation for the past few years, and with Josh, he himself has lived that life accordingly. He's quite cold-hearted, and when people praise his accomplishments, he doesn't pay much mind to it, as at this point, he's just numb to all the praise. So, after a session of fencing with one of his tutors, in which he easily outperforms his opponent, his colleague asks him for the reasons as to why on earth he's joining the Instructor Corps willingly. Josh says it bluntly, and to him, he's just bored, and he thinks by accepting these orders, he might find something that finally interests him after all this time. After this brief scene with Josh, we're introduced to an individual who is at a similar level as him, although a person who wasn't born into wealth. Eton Heathrow, an honored graduate of one of the Federation's most decorated military academies, a studious man who worked hard to get his perfect grades. We are introduced to Eton at a ceremony to his graduation from the military academy. He graciously accepts his diploma and the position he's now been given by his mentor as the new captain of his own ship. We then cut to space, to the man who has been assigned to command the Instructor Corps. This man's name is Brave Cod. We are introduced to this man during his return from a mobile suit combat patrol mission near and around an asteroid base and command center of the Instructor Corps itself, the asteroid base of Pezun. For those who are unaware, Pezun is actually an asteroid that was meant to be featured in another conceptual Gundam story, one that was actually planned to be animated, that being the mysterious MSX. Now, MSX was an early concept for a Gundam spin-off. Keep in mind that this was before Zeta Gundam was ever released, so at the time, the idea for the next Gundam story was kind of up in the air at the time. Regardless of the fact that it wasn't animated, the bare-bones components of the original story were salvaged, and some of its briefly used elements were later used in the creation of Sentinel. Peizun is one of these elements. MSX would have followed a separate series of battles during the One Year War, in a different sector of space. Peizun was once a Xeon laboratory, responsible for creating some of the most powerful and strange mobile suits that have ever been fielded by Xeon. MSX would have told the story of how the Federation was able to take control of the asteroid, with the fa 782 Heavy Gundam leading the charge. Anyways, at this point within the UC, Peizun acts as nothing more than a backwater base for the EFSF. Brave Cod returns from his patrol and docks in the asteroid's hangar. There, once inside, he notices a strange new mobile suit that has been brought out for testing here at the base, an original machine built here in the laboratories. This mobile suit is known as the Zeku Ains. These machines are incredibly bulky yet extremely powerful despite their sheer weight and size. Brave himself finds the suit to be quite impressive as he passes it by. As he meets with his superiors, Brave is given his new orders from command, with the original asteroid base captain finally seeing it as his time to let Brave carry the torch. He leaves him to return to Earth, with Brave given total command of this massive space fortress. Finally, the prologue ends with one more character being introduced this being a scientist by the name of Dr. Carl. One of his assistants brings him a list of the people who have been assigned as part of his project, 
and this list includes all of the previous characters that have been introduced so far. One name, however, catches his attention, that being Ryu, with Dr. Carl being one of the people who witnessed the incident that took the life of Ryu's mother. He finds it interesting that he's one of the people who's been chosen by the system. Maith Roots, Ryu's mother, spent her entire career working on the project that Carl is working on right now, a project that began during the One Year War. It hasn't seen the completion of till now, this being the completion of the Advanced Logistics and Inconsequence Cognizing Equipment, also known as the Alice. Now, what exactly is Alice? Alice, for the lack of a better term, is an artificial intelligence. Maith Roots was the scientist who was in charge of developing it. Alice's goal was to reach a human level of intelligence, and with this intelligence, the AI could be used to man unmanned mobile suits in battle, an ability that would have benefited the Federation during the days of the war. Maith in many ways gave her life to being the creator of Alice. Maith herself was an important influence on Alice's early cognitive development, almost like a mother. And now, it seems that the time has come for the project to begin bringing in the candidates who will act as the rest of her family. Ryu Roots and all the others have been chosen for this project, to help guide her as she grows. Dr. Carl makes note that this won't be easy. The project has been having some issues over the past few years, and the explosion that took the life of Ryu's mother is believed to have been an act of sabotage. We do not know who yet, and with the Federation's support for the project dwindling, things may be about to get a bit more chaotic as the Federation begins to demand more results. The Doctor then meets with the drill instructor who introduces him to the 12 men chosen to be a part of this team. The chapter ends with 10 of them being sent to the briefing room to begin their briefing on their job within the Instructor Corps and as testers for the Alice Project, with Ryu and another pilot by the name of Crypt being immediately sent to isolation, as the drill instructor already knows about the situation about these two rabble rousers, and sends them there in hopes of hopefully breaking their spirits a bit. As the prologue comes to an end, Dr. Carl worries about Ryu. He wonders if it's a really good idea to have him here. He lost his father in the war and his mother died in the accident. He fears that because of this, Ryu isn't going to be the best person to make use of in the project. Regardless, Alice certainly has her work cut out for her. The prologue finally ends after this, with our characters meeting up for the first time, each from different walks of life and backgrounds within the Federation forces. All of these men met at Peizun on this day and the prologue ends with two years passing. It is now the year Universal Century 0087, and the Grips War has now begun. Over this period of time, the Titan's ideology of Earth supremacy has greatly influenced the men at Peizun. The chapter begins actually towards the end of the war. Paptimus Shirako has already assassinated Jamatov Hyman and now leads the Titans in his stead. However, at Peizun, our cast of characters have only heard the news of his death via rumors spreading throughout the chain of command. Tosh Kray is now a colonel, and with Jamatov's death, Many of the Earthborn elite of Peizun believe it is their duty to protect the planet from the space noids who they believe are the reasons for their supreme leader's demise. Time passes, and in late January of UC-0088, the Titans as we know them were defeated by the AU, victorious over their tyranny. With the remaining Federation forces choosing to side with the AU, things began to get very bad the little backwater asteroid. The Peizun asteroid was ordered by the Federation to comply with the order to be reabsorbed back into the Federation forces following the Titans ostracizing. However, those still loyal to the Titans refused. To them, the leadership of the EFF was being helmed by those who'd opposed the quote-unquote righteous cause of the Titans. They side with the Ayuk now, and now the forces within the asteroid have revolted, and those loyal to the Titans within the Instructor Corps, Tosh Kray, Josh Offshore, and Brave Cod, and those loyal to them, now hold the asteroid of Peizun as their own personal fortress. Federation, with now having to deal with both the asteroid threat and the arrival of Mon Karn's Neo Zeon, have now assembled a response team a task force to end the threat of Peizun before it spirals out of control for them. We cut down to some of our boys in Nevada. Ryu and Crypt have been testing out the simulations on a new series of suits that are being developed for this mission, the Zeta Plus B-Types. They've been receiving word though that they'll be trying out something real very soon. No more CG trials on the simulator for them. They've been hearing rumors about something new and something big. A Gundam might be making its way over to them, and the two of them 
are looking forward to trying it out, despite the fact that Ryu still can't stop getting shot down in the simulator. Over in the control room, the officers at the Nevada base are going over both the data on this new Gundam and the mission to recapture the asteroid that will take place over the next month. Stoll Mannings himself is actually here at the base, and he expresses his concerns for both the prototype and the mobile suit pilots that have been assigned to the task force. However, Dr. Carl reassures him that the experimental Gundam they'll be receiving will be exactly what they need to show those remnants at Peizun the strength that the Federation actually possesses. It won't matter how skillful the pilots are, as long as they make enough noise and cause enough chaos, the enemy should get scared enough to surrender to the Federation's demands. However, Manning still has his concerns for the team. The kind of aces they're up against, and with all the rejects their team is comprised of, he fears that they might actually need a whole fleet of Gundams just to pull off this kind of suicide mission. The scene ends with an ominous note, with Shin Crypt Simulator giving him one word as his unit gets shot down again from another failed test. Death. Now, for those who are a bit confused, I want to make this very clear. Sentinel does not read like a traditional Gundam story. For those who are expecting more character development and depth, this isn't really the kind of story for that. Sentinel reads like this, very brief character interactions, and extremely detailed events and descriptions of the mobile suits and the combat that surrounds them, but also has several major time jumps in between chapters and even within chapters. For those who want an official animated series of Sentinel, I worry that those people forget that this isn't really a good pick for that. Yes, it would make a very good movie, or as we've seen before in games like the SD Gundam series, a good video game, but it probably wouldn't work well as a show in my opinion. Nonetheless, the characters are easily identifiable. They all have their own distinct personalities and attitudes, but the real show of Sentinel is primarily the space battles. Now that I've said my piece about that, let's carry on. In space, we cut to Josh, who's currently on patrol around Peizun's perimeter. Flying around in space doesn't exactly sit well with him, though. To him, and by extension the others at Peizun, he doesn't quite like the idea of humanity expanding out into this void. To him, it feels like the more humanity explores it, the less majestic of a place it becomes. He speaks with his squadron mate about this idea, and his squad mate reassures Josh in their cause that the space noids and their corrupt ways need to be stopped, that space can remain as beautiful as they see it now. As the patrol team of Zeku Ains return to the base, we get to see what Peizun has grown to become over the course of the Grips War. Massive clusters of debris, intense defense systems, and a massive complement of mobile suits to defend it. Upon their return to the control room, Josh is met by Brave Cod, who shows him footage from a hidden surveillance camera that Josh himself had set up. It seems an agent made off with Peizun's combat data. The conversation between the two of them switches to a confirmation. Despite the theft of their data, they have more allies now, and with their forces, the New Decides, as they call themselves, will continue to fight on to the bitter end. The name, New Decides, as you may not know, derives their name not from the word decision, as most people think, but rather from the words disapproval, or dissident, and side, as this force is a Titan's remnant faction and have a strong anti-colonial stance. Brave Cod himself even explains right away what it's meant to mean, and honestly, it's a fine name, if it is a little corny. We cut to a month later. Operation Maelstrom has resulted in a success. The Titans have been overthrown by the AU, and Neo Zeon have been briefly held back for the time being. However, Neo Zeon's threat is on the rise now, forcing the Federation to turn their attention to them. This leaves us with the new Decides, now able to begin making allies with the remaining Titans' remnants that they possess that still remain in space. Particularly, the new Decides aim to gather allies from the Titans' remnant forces that remain on the moon. In response to their rising power, the Federation, still having to deal with the impending invasion of Haman's Neo Zeon, have secretly established Task Force Alpha and have charged them with the objective of defeating the new Decides. The Federation claims they are an elite force of pilots and soldiers ready to take them on, but in reality, it's anything but. Since a majority of the Titans were deemed as traitors by the Federation, and all their forces were either killed at the Battle of Grips II or survived to side with the new Decides, 
the members of Task Force Alpha actually consist of people who don't exactly fit the bill for an elite force. They've been given powerful and expensive weapons and equipment, but the men who are at the helm are not what you'd want to be tasked with a high-stakes mission like this. Most of them are rejects and washouts from the Instructor Corps, and even fewer of them are even properly trained to handle mobile suits, Ryu Roots and Shin Crypt included. And now, thanks to these orders, they've been given an Argama-class cruiser, several expensive Gundam-type mobile suits, and a small fleet of support ships to help them try to take on an entire fortress from a group of expertly trained and heavily equipped Titans followers. The chapter ends with their ship launching and the members of Task Force Alpha heading off into space. Now, since I saw it as fitting for the situation and the fact this story gives off some great descriptions of the mobile suit and space battles, I'd like to introduce you to our old friend, the Battle Grid. This story is actually going to need it this time. And with the beginning of Chapter 2, we finally get to see where Sentinel's light truly shines in its space battles. We cut to a Federation mobile suit recon squadron, consisting of two groups amounting to six mobile suits in total, three groups of Jim 3s and three of Nero's. Nero's, for those who don't know, are one of the new grunt suits that this story introduces. Think of them as a slightly fancier version of a Nemo. These forces have been sent by the Federation to gather intel on the Pezun asteroid to aid in Task Force Alpha's mission, as well as to investigate the combat strength of the new decides. The chapter immediately opens up, though, with this force getting absolutely decimated. The panicking Jim 3 pilots getting picked apart as the Neros with AWAC units try to flee only to get immediately cut down to pieces by the new decides and the arrival of their Zekuwine squadron. The only thing to make it out being a single data pod from one of the Neros that managed to get it sent out before getting shanked in the back with a beam saber. The scene ends with Josh and Tosh worried as they learn that one of the pods managed to escape. We turn over, once again we get another little time skip. We turn over to a week later, and Task Force Alpha is at the Federation Forces Orbital Relay Station of Penta. The crew has just made it off the planet, and from Penta, they intend to do their final checks before the mission begins. In this moment, Ryu is incredibly excited about what's coming next. The remainder of their mobile suits are being equipped and loaded onto the ship. No more is he stuck in the simulator running the testing data for his Gundam. Now, it's time to fly the real thing. To coincide with all this, Ryu gets promoted to second lieutenant, a rank given to him that is implied to simply be for the fact that he needs this rank so that he can be allowed to pilot his mobile suit. Later he arrives in the briefing room, where he meets up with Crypt and Mannings, who is now giving the members of the entire task force their orders. As the meeting begins, another face makes their arrival, a tall man by the name of Tex West. Surprisingly, he's not a Federation officer, though. Rather, he's from Karaba. The two idiots make a joke about how strange it is that an Earthnoid is joining their team, and as the two of them whisper to each other, Mannings begins to brief them on their actual opponents going forward. One month ago, he informs them, members of the Instructor Corps from Pezun defected to the Titans and seized control of the Pezun asteroid. With the aid of the asteroid's nuclear pulse thrusters, they've managed to move the asteroid out of its fixed orbit and have positioned it right between the territories of Side 2 and Side 5. From its new position, it doesn't look like they will be able to drop the asteroid onto Earth, yet the fact they've taken up residence within this area doesn't exactly bode well. He then tells them of the recon unit from earlier that was sent by Side 2 to try and investigate, and the entire team witnessed the hellscape they're about to enter. The entire team witnesses the recorded scan data of the entire force of six mobile suits sent to Pezun get cut to pieces in less than five minutes by simply two of the new Decide Zeku Ains. As the team freaks out about who exactly it is they're going up against, Mannings reminds them of who's within this force. Every man who was at the asteroid were all members of their former team a couple years ago. They all participated together in the development of the Zeku Ains, and from that, they should all know what kind of firepower these guys should have under their belts. Their only hope is the data their agents managed to acquire from the enemy, as we the readers know that this data isn't that good. If you read the conversation from before with Josh and Brave Cod, the data is possibly falsified. As the two punks take note about the fact that they got stuck with Mannings as their superior, you can't help but ask 
why it was that Crypt was promoted a rank higher than Ryu for this mission. Crypt himself says that it's because he's leading his own squadron into battle. The Pegasus 3 has been given a trio of full armor double Zetas, and Crypt is to act as their squadron leader. Ryu gets annoyed though that Crypt is getting the special treatment, even though he himself has been tasked with piloting the experimental S Gundam. Tex West then enters the room and tells the two that Manning is waiting for them to begin their training exercises. Ryu brushes them off though, but this quickly leads to Manning's coming from behind and chucking a luggage container at the back of his head. As Ryu stumbles to the ground, Manning shows him his prosthetic leg, warning him about the consequences of causing trouble in their unit. Ryu storms out of the room, leaving Manning's to ponder the bizarre fact Ryu, the brashest man he's ever met, was chosen to pilot this highly experimental Gundam they've been given. He then worriedly remembers the rumors that he'd been hearing about Ryu. Could it really be true? And that Ryu is in fact a new type. Alright guys, it's battle grid time. As their training goes underway, we cut over to Peizun. It seems the Pegasus 3 and her fleet have entered Peizun's long range scanners, and it seems their defenses aren't entirely set up for when the Federation arrives. Tosh Cray quickly pulls up the data on what they have about the fleet. The information they get on them reassures them that this will be easy. By the looks of it, their leader is a rookie. However, their command ship is a newer model, with them having no data on the mobile suit forces they possess. He orders Josh to slow them down, hold the line till the defense network goes online. As Josh gets ready, he and his wingman Zek Mines are fitted with Type 2 long range assault gear. Their job to hold back the ship from long range and find out what they're up against in the meantime. We then cut to Crypt at midnight. He's brought from his quarters into the control room. He's being sent into battle. Heizun has sent long-range mobile suits to intercept their fleet. Crypt and his FAZ squadron are being sent out to intercept them. In the hangar, Crypt is met by one of his wingmen, named Grism. The two of them are being sent out in their FAZs with their third man, Aldrin, being stationed at the rear to cover the ships. The two Gundams launch, they ready their mega beam cannons. Several pulses on the radar are bolting towards them. The two pull back on their thrusters and narrowly miss the enemy's shots. As they try to find the source of them, they see them. Four of them coming from within their firing range. Crypt quickly orders Grism to fire a shot as soon as he does, as if Crypt misses, then Grism can adjust his fire to compensate. Beams charge and fire. Laser stream lasts a whole three seconds. With that colossal shot from its mega cannon, he misses. As the two rotate their shots back and forth, we cut over to Josh, who can't help but notice the immense energy from their opponent's weapons. It's almost as if they're trying to snipe them with their own cruiser's main guns. But due to the way they're shooting, Josh can already begin to figure out what kind of weapons these guys have. Either they have heavy weapons mobile suits, or they're possibly using a mobile armor. Seeing that both sides are equally accurate and equipped, two teams engage in a fierce sniper battle, with neither side able to land a hit on each other. Two sides expend the rest of their ammunition, it seems the new sides achieve their objective after all, with a single code phrase sounding to them of their victory and the end of the chapter. The garden has been decorated. Peizun's defense network is online. Now, one thing I never realized is just how heavily armed Peizun's defenses are. The story explains in immense detail how much shit the new decides actually have, and it's honestly very intimidating. The defense system of Peizun is broken into three parts. Firstly, they have their fleet, and the mobile suit forces that defend the base, which are to be expected. Secondly, the new decides still have access to Peizun's original Xeon satellite defense system. And thirdly, and the one thing that makes this thing so threatening, the entire outer perimeter surrounding the base has everything you can imagine. Peizun is currently positioned square in the middle of a massive debris field. This consists of weaponized asteroids, armed with explosives and thrusters to launch at enemies. Even destroyed and sunken warships from the One Year War have been refitted and reconfigured into stationary and automated weapons turrets. Colony debris from the One Year War as well has been positioned to provide insane levels of protection from long-ranged attacks. And to top it all off, and because it's going to become apparent in a short moment, the asteroid draws its power from a massive captured solar energy collector satellite, belonging to the Psi-2 debris cluster, the Sol-7804. This satellite will become the focal point of the next part of the battle. On Crypt's return, after the 
battle subsided, Mandings goes over their new problem. It seems throughout their whole mission to hold back their attackers, it seems they bought the enemy enough time to set up their defense network. The man can't help but feel like they've been played this whole time. As Commander Heathrow, captain of the ship, begins to order the retreat, Mandings relays that they can't do that. The moment they begin to turn their backs, the enemy will open fire on them with the asteroid's main base cannons. If they try to call for help, it won't show up in time for them to make an impact. They're three days from side five. They haven't been properly preparing their own defenses for what is coming. The ship, with no other options, begins to make a forward-facing retreat from Peizu. As they do so, the fleet is hit with a barrage of missiles, beam cannons, and mines. The scene quickly cuts over to Brave Cod, who is currently observing the battle from afar via laser link to Peizun. It seems he's on a mission of his own while Tosh holds down the fort. Tosh informs Brave of his concerns regarding the retreat, but it seems Brave is unbothered by it. He knows they wouldn't be able to try anything until reinforcements arrive. If anything, they'll send in mobile suits to try and attack their defenses. But from the range they're positioned from, no mobile suit could even get close enough to try and attack them before getting blown to bits by their defense grid. Tosh himself can't help but be reminded though of the Zeta Gundam. He can recall that the data that that unit has the potential to speed past their grid. And from the fact that he's heard rumors it was being mass produced, Tosh worries that this unit may actually have the ability to break through their defense grid, and judging from the firepower they witnessed with the FAS units, it wouldn't be out of the question to judge they didn't have them. Brave himself doesn't believe it though. One of the suits they themselves have is the Zeku's Y. The only people capable of handing that monster of a thing are all fighting for the new decides. Thus, from this angle, and judging by Tosh's concerns, Brave can already guess what Task Force Alpha's next target will be. The Soul 7804. Their orders are now to defend it. We cut over to Task Force Alpha, and the team is still working to escape Peizun's firing range, firing anti-beam dispersal missiles to cover their retreat. However, due to the difficulty now posed by the anti-beam dispersal field, the fleets now can only rely on their missiles to attack one another. As the battle continues and explosions continue to occur, two of the Solomus Kai-class cruisers to the front and to the left of their retreating formation are struck by a pair of satellite-guided missiles. As the fleet attempts to take evasive maneuvers, the two cruisers instantly explode. Two ships' reactor cores igniting the cruisers in two blue-pink balls of fire. As Heathrow panics and orders a crew to rescue whatever survivors remain, Mannings says it's no use. Just after those explosions, they just managed to escape from Peizun's firing range. The fact they only lost two vessels out of the five they have is honestly a blessing. Keep in mind that this is essentially one of Heathrow's first battles where he gets to command his own fleet so Manning's words to him comes off as a little too heartless. However, he says if they had lost their command ship instead, their whole fleet would have been picked off easily without the ability to communicate with the others. As they escape, Manning's unveils the second stage of their survival plan going forward. Heathrow, concerned with protecting his men and waiting for reinforcements, exclaims that they should wait for help. However, Manning's explains to him the plan that he's now cooked up thanks to him figuring out what kind of threat they're up against. With the ship outside of their firing range for the moment, and the enemy believing they've beaten their foes back for the time being, as well as Manning's now knowing the current state of Peizun's current defense systems, Manning's offers that the next plan right now should be on the offensive, now rather than later. And this time, they'll do it with mobile suits, the S Gundam and the Zeta Pluses to the front, and the Faz Squadron to the rear to defend their ships. Their job was to cut off the source of Peizun's energy production. The Soul 7804. We cut to the S Gundam, and for this engagement, it has had its lower body equipped with a massive booster apparatus. Its job will be to break through their lines at top speed and destroy the satellite. As Ryu prepares to launch, he's given his orders. Throughout the conversation with Mannings, he is impatiently waiting to get out into the fight, as it is his first time truly using the S Gundam instead of the constant tests he's performed in the simulator with the data. However, nothing has prepared him for the intense g-forces that the S Gundam can actually deliver. As soon as they all launch from the catapults and take up formation, he bolts past his wingmen at top speed with his long-range boosters engaged. As Ryu and the Zeta Pluses rocket towards the satellite, we cut over to Tosh Kray, who's flying his Zeku Ains towards the satellite. 
However, an insane heat signature is blasting its way towards them at an insane speed, as Kray informs Brave of what's happening over the laser comms, and of the impending attack, which they had expected to occur much later, he orders that the entire mobile suit force launch immediately. Over with Ryu, his Zeta Plus wingman are having a hard time keeping pace. It's going so fast that at the speed he's traveling, he might just overshoot the satellite itself. But strangely, as Ryu flies, he can hear a strange ringing noise coming from behind his ears. The sound tells him that everything will come down to the single shot he's about to fire. Everything is depending on it. As we cut over to Brave, the man is bewildered as Peizun's asteroid weapons platforms are unable to secure a lock on the approaching mobile suit. The man orders his men over, over the laser comms to scatter their mobile suit forces to defend the satellite. As the Zeku Line squadron desperately tries to shoot down the S Gundam, their shots easily bounce off its armor as it rockets towards them. Ryu and his wingmen open fire. Josh Offshore's wing Man, the one he had had a conversation with during his patrol, is cut to pieces as the Zeta Plus units tear one of the Zeku Ains to pieces with a single beam rifle shot. The man becoming enraged as he witnesses and listens to the man's exploding mobile suit over the comms. The S Gundam keeps on rocketing past them and manages to fire a single shot that pierces a clean hole straight through the center of the satellite. As Ryu rockets past the remains of it, the S Gundam continues to accelerate. It seems Ryu's cocky attitude has finally bit him in the ass. The force created by the upgraded booster engine literally made him piss his pants from the insane G-forces. Still, the S Gundam still blasts through space, managing to take a second shot at a Zeku Ainz that cuts another enemy unit to pieces. Over with Josh, it seems that another one of his wingmen was killed. Josh Cray, just able to evade two of the Zeta Plus's shots as he attempts to fire back. Throughout all this, Josh is frozen. Is there no way of stopping this? What kind of mole suit is that? It was able to take down some of their best pilots with ease. With Josh and Tosh being ordered to identify the remains of the dead, the battle soon draws to a close, with the S Gundam and the Zeta Plus team managing to return without a single casualty. However, the same thing can't be said about the damage to their mobile suits. The S Gundam, if it were going any slower, would have taken way more damage than it did. However, the same couldn't be said about the Zeta Plus units. Unlike the Zeta Gundam, many people will take note that the Zeta Plus is supposed to be a Zeta Gundam that's had its entire systems overhauled, but the same thing can't be said about its armor. Zeta Plus units actually have much weaker armor compared to the original one piloted by Camille. These units are extremely fast, but also extremely lightly armored. The mission successful, and the heroes victorious, Ryu and Crypt celebrate their success. However, the conversation turns sour as Ryu curses Mannings for this insane idea of his when he sees him, with Mannings himself whispering in his ear and making fun of the fact that everyone can smell his pilot suit. The chapter ends with some news as a little more time passes. Over the course of the next two days, Task Force Alpha would receive reinforcements, two new ships, and more attention from the Federation Forces High Command. It seems that the Federation Hearing news of the situation regarding the Peizun rebels has finally authorized the deployment of a larger contingent of troops to go and help with the situation at the asteroid. So, like I mentioned before, Sentinel is a short read. Most of the story plays out in these little set-piece battles and small conversations between characters, whereas the major plot points and larger lore elements are relegated to short blurbs and time skips, which happens quite often, I might mind you. So just keep in mind that when there's a brief time skip that occurs and greater lore is brought up, it's usually being done so that it can set up the next battle going forward. Just remember this little system when reading Sentinel's chapters. Lore dump, brief conversations and battle discussions, the battle itself, which in this case is pretty short, more brief conversations afterwards, and then another lore dump, and then the chapter ends. So, that's it for this first video on my series Dissecting Gundam Sentinel. I was originally going to make this whole thing into one big video, but judging from the fact that, that this part has only covered 20% of the whole book, and we're already reaching the 40 minute mark, I think what I'll do is break this into a 4-5 to five part series. So, for my personal thoughts so far, this story is quite different from what normal Gundam fans would be used to. Whereas stories released in this time period like Zeta and Double Zeta follow the formulas that would become synonymous with the UC and later Gundam stories onward, 
this story definitely goes in its own direction. Sentinel is definitely a story for those who enjoy militaristic Gundam. The only story I can think of that is similar to this one is that of Stardust Memory. However, this one isn't one that I would consider to be part of that same category, at least by a technicality. Where Stardust Memory is very much the top gun of Gundam, Sentinel is a little more hardcore. I like to compare it like this. Where Stardust Memory is top gun, Sentinel is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Where Stardust focuses on the military dramas of the pilots as the conflict progresses, Sentinel instead goes for something more grand, the conflict between commanders and the fleets under their command. We have our two main viewpoints from each side, that being Tosh Cray and Stoll Mannings, and the idea that these two deeply understand each other as opponents. Tosh may not know yet that Stoll is a member of the task force, but Stoll absolutely knows the mindset behind the man he's been pitted against. And this story going forward will show us how far these two are going to go in order to achieve victory. As for our hero, that being Ryu, he's definitely a slight change of pace from a typical Gundam protagonist. Unlike characters like Camille, who joined the Rebellion to take revenge on the people who ruined his life, and Judo, who at this time is carefree and chill with making money off the junk he finds, Ryu is what I like to call a reversal of Camille, as well as a slight enhancement of Judo's anti-authority disposition. Ryu hates the Federation, but not because they personally wronged him. Rather, he hates them because they boss him around when all he wants to do is fly and to be free. Yes, his father was killed in the war and his mother was killed in that explosion, but he doesn't have the answers to those questions, nor, at least for now, is he actively looking for the answers. Right now, he's just got a lot of pent-up anger that he doesn't really know how to deal with, and until he has those answers, he's just gonna have to take the punches. And believe me, He's gonna get punched a lot. Seriously, the amount of punches Ryu takes in this book is ridiculous. Seriously, to the point where the bright slap feels like a joke. Going forward, he truly grows into a real soldier though, even if he doesn't show it right now. Anyways, that'll be it for this first video dissecting and analyzing the events of Gundam Sentinel. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and right now with me having a new job and having to see how much time I really have to spend on working on this series, let's hope that bit by bit we'll be able to chip away at this tale at a nice pace. Like I said, I hope you've had a good holiday, and I hope you stay tuned for the next video where we go into the second part of Gundam Sentinel and the arrival of, of reinforcements for our heroes within Task Force Alpha. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, turn on the notification bell to make sure you're caught up with my videos, and this is Gaia Gaius, signing off. Bye!